Greetings, comrades, friends, and supporters, patrons. Welcome to African History Club, episode number 32. I am your host, Milton Alimadi. Today, I want to talk about Mozambique in Southern Africa. There is a major conflict raging in the northeast corner of the country. It happens to be the part of the country which is endowed with significant natural gas deposits right off the Indian Ocean coast. Estimated 100 trillion cubic feet it would make it the third largest deposit on the African continent after Nigeria and Algeria. So Mozambique would be number three. The conflict, I wholeheartedly believe, has something to do with the natural gas deposits and the foreign companies that are going to be exploiting that, specifically Total of France. Before I get into that, I also wanted to point out the subject of my next two podcasts. The next one, I will look at Africa Day, which is celebrated internationally on May the 25th. That is the day when, in 1963, the Organization of African Unity was founded in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, by the leaders of the African countries that were independent by that time. Not all African countries had won their independence that early on. But I will go into the details of that because that's going to be the subject of the next podcast. Now today, before I go into Mozambique, a contemporary issue, a contemporary challenge, I also wanted to point out, just make a brief comment on the conflict between Israel and Palestine. And I just want to make a brief commentary because that is not the subject of today's podcast. But an interesting observation did occur to me. I was thinking about it last week and I said to myself, you know, when I watch the helplessness and the hopelessness of the Palestinians, with all these massive bombardments, aerial bombardment by Israel against a weak and puny Palestinian entity. It reminds me of many, many years ago when I was growing up. I'm born in Uganda, but I lived in Tanzania for a significant a number of years. So when I was in Tanzania, I used to be really distressed even as a kid, when I would read in the newspapers, I started reading newspapers when I think it was about nine or 10 years old. So I would read about the South African Air Force and military raiding neighboring African countries, particularly Angola. And I would say to myself, how could it be that Angola could not do a thing? You know? And then I remembered how Rhodesia which was then white ruled, now it's Zimbabwe, of course, used to also raid Zambia and bombard Zambia. In fact, the Rhodesian Air Force would call the Zambian military and let them know that they're about to launch a strike and warn them not to engage them militarily. So they would go and they would bomb refugee camps where Zambians were harboring people that had fled from white rule to Rhodesia and also bombed some of the guerrilla camps where the guerrillas were training the insurgents. And the same thing, South Africa would do that uh, to Angola. And all this memory came back to me as I was listening to the news all of last week and up to today and just comparing the hopelessness and helplessness and the total complete mismatch between Israel, a powerful armed force, armed to the hilt, 
with U.S. taxpayer dollars. And in the case of Rhodesia and South Africa, both supported by the West as well, as they use their superior firepower to hit Zambia, hit Angola, and other African states. Of course, in the case of Angola, things changed dramatically after Fidel Castro deployed tens of thousands of Cuban troops in Angola and dealt South African military a decisive defeat, as we've discussed in a previous podcast, leading to the liberation of Namibia, leading to the release of Nelson Mandela and the end of formal apartheid in South Africa. So obviously, the clear lesson here is that so long as there's such a military mismatch between Israel and Palestine, we don't see how any effective, meaningful solution to the crisis in that part of the world can never be affected. All right, so now back to the subject matter of today. As I said, the conflict is confined to the northeast part of the country that also happens to be the part where the 18% Muslim population of Mozambique is largely confined to. That is where they uh, most uh, live, are confined to. And so you see in some media, it's being portrayed as some Islamic jihadist type uprising. There are actually fundamental issues and grievances involved that initially inspired or sparked the uprising, the insurrection in 2017. But before I discuss the detail of this contemporary issue, I want to go back into some history of Mozambique because I want my patrons and friends to understand the type of devastation that Mozambique has suffered. Mozambique's chances were really snuffed at independence in 1975, when it had to deal with a counterinsurgency comparable to the Contras in Nicaragua. That is what happened. In Mozambique, they're called Renamo, also supported by white ruled Rhodesia, by South Africa, and indirectly by the United States as well. And it essentially killed the revolution in Mozambique. But let's go back into a little bit of the history. Mozambique, like the other Portuguese territories in Africa, of Guinea-Bissau and Angola, had been part of the Portuguese domain or sphere of imperialism for five centuries. Portugal was one of the earliest trespassers on the African continent. And in terms of productivity or upliftment, the most hopeless one as well. By the 1960s, when most African countries were beginning to win their independence, Portugal was digging deeper in terms of denying independence. Portugal had not produced a single educated African in Mozambique. Nobody with a high level of education. Eduardo Mondelana escaped from Mozambique, an African, and came to the United States around 1951. Went to Oberlin College, and then from there, he went to Northwestern for a master's degree, and he got a PhD from Harvard, and then taught for a number of years at Syracuse University. So this is now by the 1960s, moving to the 1960s, when most African countries are winning independence. Instead, Portugal is escalating its repressiveness in its African colonies. Uh, there was a massive massacre in 1960 in Mozambique by the Portuguese uh, colonial military. And then in 1962, Eduardo Monlana was one of the co-founders, one of the Africans who got together to form Frelimo, which became the National Liberation Movement. So he was the first president or leader of Frelimo. Now, by that time, 
Tanganyika, which is now Tanzania, had become independent, and the president of the country, uh, Julius Nyerere, invited Mondolana to set up the headquarters of Frelimo in Tanganyika. And that is where he provided them with the camps to train their guerrilla fighters, the liberation soldiers. Unfortunately, Mondolana was assassinated by a letter bomb sent by the Portuguese secret police uh, to his residence in Tanzania. By that time, the country was named, renamed Tanzania after its union with the island of Zanzibar in 1966. So Mondolana was assassinated and he was succeeded by the person who had been the field commander, the military commander, Samora Michel. He became the new leader of Frelimo and Frelimo continued pressing the war. Mind you, Frelimo was not only fighting against colonial Portugal. For Lima, as with the case of the liberation fighters in Portugal's, Portugal's other African colonies, were literally fighting against NATO because Portugal was well equipped with NATO weapons, including napalm bombs. The United States provided the weapons to Portugal under the condition that they would not be used in its overseas colonies. Of course, Portugal violated that agreement and the United States took no action because the United States really didn't care <laughs> about what happened to Africans in Portugal's colonies. Portugal was notorious for wiping out entire villages with napalm, massive bombardment, and then sending ground troops to kill unarmed innocent civilians just to terrorize them into renouncing their support for, for Frelimo. But by the 1970s, Frelimo had gained significant ground and in fact was in control of much of the northern part of Mozambique, which borders with uh, Tanzania. The Tanzanians supported Frelimo. In addition to that, Frelimo also got support uh, from China, from the Soviet Union, from some of the Scandinavian countries, from Nigeria, from Algeria, and a few other countries. So they started making significant gains and eventually exhausted the Portuguese military. So that by 1974, the Portuguese military got so tired of fighting this war that they could not win, that suffered many defeats on the battlefield. The soldiers had been told that they could not lose to Africans and to their shock, they suffered many battleground defeats and they became extremely demoralized. So back in Portugal, the armed forces in Portugal itself overthrew the government in Portugal in 1974 and immediately started negotiating the terms of their surrender in Portugal's African colonies. So that in 1975, Mozambique won its independence under the leadership of Samora Michel and Frelimo, which had adopted Marxism-Leninism as its philosophy. So initially, Samora tried a policy of reconciliation, but it did not have any breathing space. By 1976, many of the European so-called settlers, I really refrain from calling them settlers. I don't believe that is an appropriate term for people that come commit massacres and take over lands that belong to Africans and then take it over for themselves and then call themselves uh, settlers and for successive generations as well. That is not a term that I find easy to use. Nevertheless, they had fled either to South Africa or to white rural Rhodesia. These are the ones that did not flee back to Portugal itself. So they 
in collaboration with some African dissidents, launched an insurgency, a counter-revolutionary war. And the movement was called RENAMO, R-E-N-A-M-O. Those were the acronyms. And RENAMO got support from Rhodesia, from South Africa. These are the former colonials, Europeans, wanting to come back and overturn the revolution in the hope that they would get their lands, their mines, and other wealth that had, they had accumulated in Mozambique to get all that back. The war was devastating. Renamo never even pretended that it had any agenda or that it wanted to defeat the Mozambican military. It never really attacked the Mozambican army. This is the kind of war that is almost impossible to win. They would attack and destroy rail, railways. They would attack hospitals, kill people in hospitals and destroy the hospitals and clinics. They would attack schools, destroy the buildings, kill the students. They only went primarily after civilian targets. They called, they caused ethnic cleansing by depopulating people from their farmlands. And eventually there was famine in parts of the country where people were forced to abandon agriculture and flee and stay into internal refugee camps in other parts of Mozambique. So by 1984, Mozambique had literally been brought to its knees. And this, of course, if you look at the bigger picture, then in the bigger picture analysis, you would say, this is once again can be traced back to the failure <laughs> of African countries to really come together and form a United States of Africa. Because that is the only way they would ever be able to protect themselves against Western finance counter-revolutionary forces such as this. But we're not looking at the broader picture right now. We're being very specific to Mozambique. How far down in terms of destruction had Mozambique come? In 1984, Samora Machel was compelled to sign a non-aggression pact with South Africa called the Nkomati Agreement, N-K-O-M-A-T-I. And as part of that agreement, he had to expel the leadership of liberation movements, such as Robert Mugabe's ZANU, which had stationed in Mozambique, and Samara Machel was providing them with training and resources and bases, just as Tanganyika and then Tanzania had earlier, before Mozambique won its independence, also provided similar support to Frelimo. But now under this agreement, he was forced to kick them out of Mozambique. And even then, the war of aggression and destruction still continued. So in 1985, Samora Machel is now reaching out to the United States and the United States, under Ronald Reagan, actually invites them to the White House. And that visit was in September 1985, because obviously the U.S. wants to neuter all the African countries that border either white-ruled Rhodesia or white-ruled apartheid South Africa, and to neutralize any prospects for ultimate liberation in South Africa. So yes, that is how far down the re revolution had been disseminated in Mozambique. That Samora Machel, a revolutionary liberation fighter, had to humble himself and come to the United States and meet with Ronald Reagan and get some form of financial assistance, which of course comes with a massive rope not even strings, but rope, <laughs> you know, which literally forms the noose around your neck. Tragically, Samara Machel lived only one more year. 
the following year, so Mother Michelle died in a very questionable plane crash. He was traveling back to Mozambique from Zambia. There was speculation that the plane may have been lured by a false signal that was deployed by apartheid South Africa to lead it misdirected into crashing into a mountain. So Mother Michelle died in that plane crash. And with Samora Michelle, much of the steam of the revolution in Mozambique also escaped. By 1989, Mozambique was actually pretty much in the World Bank IMF orbit. And as you know, the World Bank cannot lead any African country to economic independence or development. It can only lead them to ruin and dependency. 1992, Renamo became an official opposition party. Even with all the genocidal wars that carried out against innocent civilians in Mozambique, supported by the West. Mozambique became a typical, unfortunately, African country run by the Comprador class in alliance with the World Bank and the IMF, basically as stewards of Western interests in Mozambique, as is the case in most African countries as well. And the Mozambican citizens, the ordinary people, the masses, masses whom Samora Michel had wanted to empower, that was the end of that revolution. At least Samora did one thing in his lifetime, land redistribution and land reform, granted vast amounts of land to Mozambicans who had been dispossessed during Portuguese colonial rule. So now we come to the current conflict in Mozambique. And this is why I'm highly suspicious of anything I read about the insurgencies. Yes, they're committing atrocities. I can tell that by the reports that, are re that I've read. They're called, they call themselves Al-Shabaab, very similar to the same group which also exists in Somalia, or al Al-Ansar, al al they also call themselves that. Now, why is this highly suspicious? The insurgency started around 2017 by young men who are unemployed. There's massive unemployment in Mozambique. The country is very young, like the entire African continent, where more than 60% of the population of the continent is under the age of 25. And unemployment is very high, ranging from 60 to 80% in most African countries. And this particular part of the country is the most neglected, the Northeast part of the country, the most marginalized, discriminated against by the central government, and partly or essentially because they happen to be Muslims. So many of the youth could not take it anymore and they started waging this combat. Initially, they attacked police stations, government targets, and they attacked government officials for the neglect of that part of the country. But then, in more recent years, they started targeting, essentially, civilians, which was very unusual, because initially, they would actually provide free food, free fuel to the civilians after stealing it from the government soldiers and other government sources. But now some of the acts, the atrocities that they've been carrying out, it's hard to even believe that this is the same movement that started the fighting in 2017. There have been reports of beheadings, 
mass killings of civilians, burning down entire villages, and now there are estimates that as many as 200,000 people may have been killed since 2017, and another 600,000 displaced from their homes. Here's why I find this conflict very questionable and suspicious. Not that it's not going on, of course it is, but the elements in terms of the people behind it. Number one, if you see images that have been posted of these young fighters, they're all dressed in neat combat fatigues. These are not ragtag armies. They have the most sophisticated equipment with them, communication equipment. So who's really arming and supplying them with the state-of-the-art equipment? It can't be only equipment that they're capturing from soldiers, no. They look very neat as if they have a permanent supply line coming from somewhere outside the country. That's number one. Number two, why are they not attacking any of the assets of the French company Total, which is building the infrastructure to exploit the natural gas? Why? Why are all, one of the grievances allegedly was that all these foreign workers are coming to work on this Total project and that none of the indigenous population are being hired on these projects. So why are these personnel, the foreign personnel, not being attacked in addition to the assets? It is too convenient for Total. And that is why I think some of the reporting may not be as exhaustive as should be. And then I noticed that much of the reporting and the quotes in the, many of the publications I've read, including in ordinarily good publications like The Guardian, are relying mostly on official sources, so government sources being quoted, the police or government officials, which even raises questions in terms of the actual atrocities themselves. Are all the atrocities really being committed only by the insurgents? And I raise this question because I'm much more familiar with the conflict in Uganda when the war between the government and the Lord's Resistance Army was raging. It's now been conclusively determined that many of the atrocities were carried out by the Ugandan government soldiers against civilians in Uganda, in the northern part of Uganda, including the mutilation of civilians. And why did they do that? To get Western support, to get Western arms and Western endorsement of the regime. And in the case of Uganda, the dictatorship of General Yoweri Museveni. It's been there for 35 years now and just stole another election in January from Bobby Wine. Are these factors also at play in Mozambique? I would not be surprised at all. Especially now when you hear that about two weeks ago, the Mozambican government has invited Western military support to fight against this insurgency. He invited the United States to send in military experts, he invited many of the NATO countries, including Portugal, the former colonial power, which of course would have Samora Machel rolling in his grave. And here is one other final observation. Total recently asked for a 35-mile radius, a perimeter, that should be uninhabited. And allegedly, that would provide them the safety and confidence to continue with this project for the natural gas exploitation. I think there are enough pieces out there already, just based on these anecdotes, to, su su to suggest that this war is not just as being portrayed in some of the media as a bunch of crazed Islamists doing what crazed Islamists always do. There's a lot of the foreign 
particularly multinational corporation, massive company like Total. I think that part of the reporting has not been adequately carried out. And obviously, I myself am looking deeper into that, and I hope to do an update of this presentation in the very near future, should my reporting come up with some more substantial facts. So that's why I wanted to focus on Mozambique today from the dream of fighting and defeating Portuguese colonialism to wanting to create a socialist society under Samora Michel. That was his dream and Frelimo's dream in 1975 to where we are today, a neo-colonial state working with Total. And I would not be surprised if they're working in cahoots against the civilians in that part of the country where the rich natural gas valued at tens of billions of dollars is concentrated. So I think that wraps up this episode number 32. I will definitely do an update on the Mozambique tragedy in the next few weeks after I do some more extensive reporting. I want to thank all of you for your support We've had 32 episodes now, and I think each week, hopefully, we'll be able to provide some more new, interesting knowledge to supporters. Thank you. Stay strong, stay healthy, and remain, as always, Pan-African.